Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 12th of February 2017. How often is it a three-year-old Linux distribution gains a new feature? The feature in this instance is the ability to install snaps. Well that is exactly what has happened for the long-term support release of Ubuntu 14.04, codenamed Trusty Tar. Snap-based applications open an older system up to a world of new and updated applications than it originally came with. That's brilliant news for the user, that you no longer have to hunt around for extra third-party repositories to add to your system. It is also good news for developers because they don't have to repackage Snap-based applications for another version of Ubuntu. SnapD has already landed in the trusty archives, and Ubuntu developers have been running many manual and automated tests on it. Now they would like to invite the community to test it, explore weird paths, and try and break it. Who is still running Ubuntu 14.04 in the current year? Oh, me, on my home theater PC, and moving swiftly along. The open source graphics Mesa version 13.0.4 is coming to Ubuntu 16.04. Ah, no it is not going to be in Ubuntu 16.04. Currently it can only be installed with the Ubuntu X SWAT repository. Ubuntu 16.04 has only just received Mesa 12.0.6 release as a stable release update, together with Ubuntu 16.10. The Ubuntu X SWAT PPA carries the latest LLVM 3.9.1 package, as well as some fixes for Radeon users. There were some games released recently that benefit from these updates, which is one more reason why these backports were finally made available. Ubuntu 17.04 will ship with Mesa version 17, that is the next version that will be backported to Ubuntu 16.04. Ubuntu Touch OTA 15 has been released. It's only a security maintenance update and doesn't add any new features to the Ubuntu Touch operating system. Now, hot on the heels of the KDE Plasma 5.9 update last week, we already have a new version of Plasma, version 5.9.1, which was released this week. This was just a bug fix release and wasn't particularly large on the download size in KDE Neon. It added a week's worth of new translations and fixes from KDE contributors. The bug fixes are typically small but important and include a fix for the i18n extraction in xgetText where it didn't recognise single quotes and a fix to set the wallpaper type in the simple desktop display manager config. Perhaps the larger update this week for me was the KDE Applications version 16.12.2, but again, looking through the release notes, it was just a bug fix update. The majority of commits were against the KDN Live video editor. But KDN Live spectacularly annoyed me yesterday when a quick edit screwed up a large section of the KDE Neon vs Kubuntu video by shifting the entire track out of place, and I ended up having to render the video five times before I got it back to a decent quality. Bloody thing. The Open Source Entertainment Center, Kodi, version 17, was released this week. I have done a more in-depth review of it already, but the most obvious change has been an entirely new theme called Estuary. Although you can install the original Confluence theme through the add-ons. Other improvements include improved stability, better refresh rate switching, and the ability to bitstream Dolby True HD and DTS HD on certain Android devices. Although, judging from the comments on my video, it appears the improved stability didn't really happen. On the contrary, it seems stability is worse. I still have yet to do a long-term test on my home theater PC, as I was waiting for the Kodi stable Ubuntu repository to catch up. The new theme looked particularly interesting on the movie display, as it provides new ways of searching for movies by country and genre. You also get a selection of randomly unwatched movies, which I can certainly appreciate, as I sometimes flick around my collection not really knowing what to watch. Keeping on the subject of Kodi and its uh, less than legal side of usage, police in the United Kingdom have arrested five people on suspicion of selling pirate set-top boxes configured to receive pay TV. The Police Intellectual Property Crime Unit teamed up with FACT, the Federation Against Copyright Theft, as well as Sky, Virgin, BT and the Premier League to arrest the sellers, who allegedly supplied Cody with unlicensed add-ons. 
After executing warrants in Tameside, Bolton, Bootle, Manchester, Cheadle and Rill, four men aged between 33 and 60, as well as a 36-year-old woman, were arrested at their homes by Pipku and the Greater Manchester Police. According to fact, so-called fully loaded set-top boxes were seized from the homes of all five suspects, who are said to have made £250,000 from sales across social media, online forums, as well as their own dedicated websites. But of course, fact never blow any of these crime stats out of proportion. Yeah, right. The XBMC Foundation have really been trying to distance the Cody name from these fully loaded boxes. And I can't blame them really, because if they sat back and did nothing, they could well be on the receiving end of all this legal action. I have to say it does annoy me when I hear people say, Cody sucks, and the reason has to do with the way they are using it. Cody sucks because some of these third-party streaming sites don't work, or it's difficult to navigate through the list of streaming sites. Hmm. But I have to say the spread of Cody has been amazing, and it shows how good and popular open source software can be, even if it is for some of the wrong reasons. In other news this week, the Samsung factory tasked with recycling defective batteries from the Galaxy Note 7 has itself gone up in flames. <laughs> oh, you just can't make it up. Defective batteries and other faulty hardware stored in a recycling centre went up in smoke at the Samsung SDI facility in Tianjin in China. No injuries were reported, although environmental protection workers have been called in to monitor air quality. The plant is snuggled in a suburban area. Some 19 fire engines and more than 110 firefighters turned up shortly after 6am to tackle the flames. Apparently, the fire occurred in an area dedicated to housing waste and defective batteries marked for recycling. The rest of the factory, including its production lines, was not significantly damaged, and normal operations will resume. The Tianjin factory is one of two that have manufactured the ill-fated battery for the Note 7 phablet. Shortly after release, the battery pack was prone to exploding without warning, and it led to Samsung having to recall the entire range, which has probably ended up costing billions of dollars in recall costs and lost sales. I hope Samsung do get through this, because they have done a lot for Linux. Well, that concludes the week of Linux news. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.